What up? What up? What up? What up?
All right, what's up? Welcome. No, I didn't get my hair cut. It's just an old clip. I miss that old song. That, that song is really cool. So I wanted to play it. And uh, we got a lot of stuff I want to talk about tonight. A lot of neat stuff. Things that we haven't really talked about yet. So let's get into it before it's too late. Before people start fussing. I have limited time. How dare you waste my time? So, look, things are getting crazy. Everybody knows things are getting crazy. That's why people in our side of things, people in our in our sphere, things that they're they're coming to to see that we were correct. They're coming over. They're they're joining our team in droves, and that's great. But one thing that really bugs me that goes on out there is that most of the big shows and all the stuff that... I'm not talking about Lord Voldemort. I'm just talking about in general, the big shows. Uh, there's a few exceptions. They don't go very deep. Everything is so boiled down and tick TikTokized into little clips that nobody gets the sufficient depth and education that you really need in these topics. And, uh, for example... What about the role of Sufism in the New World Order? Does anybody know about that? Very few do. And yet, when we read Ratio's amazing book, Sufism played a key role in bringing Islam to the West and to Europe, particularly beginning with Oxford and Cambridge, through Sufism, through Sufi mystical orders and organizations set up at Oxford, to be a beachhead, to be a base for exportation of, eventually, all forms of Islam throughout the UK, Londonistan, and then by extension, the rest of Europe. And that's a fascinating, deep history. But it began with Sufi mystical Islam, which is Neoplatonism, which is syncretism, and which ties into theosophy. And if you know this history, and that's why I wanted to talk about it, because you can't really understand. I know all about Rene Ganon. I know about Friedhof Shuan. I know about the commune. I know about Ganon going off and you know doing his thing. But what a lot of people don't know is that a lot of that had connections to the perennialism that was so close to a lot of Sufi philosophy. So many of, the, many of the perennialists were into Sufism. Many of the Sufis got into perennialism. That wasn't just an organic ideological movement. That had to do with intelligence agencies and geopolitical machinations. So first we're going to talk a little bit about Ratia's text. And we're going to do a little bit of a refresher on the Milner Fabian, the, the gigantic, the great 500 page text. That is a perfect appendix to Quigley's books. It's a perfect appendix to Tragedy and Hope. It's a perfect appendix to all the other texts in this domain, as well as Dr. John Coleman's book, which we might get into some of that too, because a lot of this ties into the means by which the British Empire was able to become so powerful the Council of 300 in regard to the British East India Company. And I had not actually reread. I'm rereading this book. I haven't read it in a long, I read it many, many years ago. Forgot it all. Don't remember much of it. Going back. Hold on. This I got to turn this light off. Much better. Going back and reading right after we did our Pirates of the Caribbean stream where we got deep into the history of the British East India Company. We, I got to the chapters in John Coleman where he's going through the whole history of the British East India Company and the opium trade. And then he goes into the history of how this backs up the modern global economy and all the big giant world banks, IMF, World Bank, BIS, all of the big credit suites and all of that. All of the different opium lanes and networks that he was writing about in the 1990s. 
But you can't really understand this until you understand British imperial geopolitics and strategy. And that's what we're going to be talking about here tonight. If you want to support my show, you can via Streamlabs right there. The link for Streamlabs is in the chat there. You can support me with any kind of super chat. I'll read your super chats here in a moment. So remember that you have a key economic powerhouses and entities set up like the London School of Economics, which was set up under Fabian Socialist pedigree. And one of the ideas that they came up with was to completely change the existing people group of first England. They would test it out with London and with England and see if they could change the ideology of the people by changing the people themselves. And so this was a kind of uh, this is an idea that first is mentioned by George Bernard Shaw in the 1930s. The idea of creating collective farms and getting all of the different ethnic people groups to go and work together on hippie farms. So basically hippie farm communes was his idea. And import tons of people and force everybody to go live on farms and congregate and collectivize together. Although the Fabians originally were atheists, and most of them, if they had a kind of Christianity, were socialist. They also had a very fascinating soft spot for Islam and the notion of Islam's teaching of universal brotherhood of all men. Both Annie Besant and Bertrand Russell, Annie Besant, the theosophist Bertrand Russell, the atheist, loved Islam. In fact, the Islamic drive for global hegemony and dominance worked well for the notion of world government. H.G. Wells praised Islam in his book, Short History of the World in 1922. Fabian socialist George Bernard Shaw wrote that Muhammad was the great Protestant, was a great Protestant religious force. Muhammad, the great Protestant religious force, according to George Bernard Shaw. George Fox or, George, uh, or uh, John Wesley could be compared to Mohammed, according to George Bernard Shaw. Other leading Fabius also were apologists for Islam, like Annie Besant, the witch, and Bertrand Russell. Now remember, these are all people in the theosophy circles of Blavatsky and the Milner Fabian socialist elite. And remember that Blavatsky was involved in espionage operations, as we see, we will see and be reminded of from Dr. Spence's uh, excellent essay. Dr. Richard Spence, not Robert Spence, not Richard Spencer, Dr. Rob, uh, Dr. Richard Spence. So again, we're getting deep into the actual history text. This is not conspiracy speculations tonight, but we're going to tie it into today's stuff with Frank, the recent uh, actions of Papa Frank. And then we're going to tie it into even some of the stuff that Biden and company and Klaus are up to. Yes, Sufi mystics absolutely are part of this stuff. Again, Sufi mysticism is very close to perennialism. And perennialists really found a home at Oxford. In fact, uh, Prince Charles is one of the patrons of one of the prominent perennialist publishers. Temenos Publishers gets Prince Charles' money, or King Charles. So perennialism has a long embedded and entrenched history at uh, Oxford and Cambridge amongst the British elite circles. And then part of that has to do with the British imperial attitude of uh, being very fascinated and, and mastering the philosophies and theologies of the colonies, you see. So they also were interested in Hinduism. You could see the caste system influences the British uh, notion of the strict uh, social Darwinist system. And you can see that the Sufi mysticism also influences British imperial policy. Part of that also has to do with Afghanistan and the Kush region. And uh, I, I interviewed uh, Gould and Fitzgerald eight years ago, experts on this topic, in terms of British imperial strategy in Afghanistan. And it even ties into uh, Rumi. Rumi's mysticism, Rumi was... Probably all everybody who's a New Ager is probably you've probably seen a Rumi quote on a uh, you know on a 
bunch of beads in some hippie chick's apartment or something, right? Hanging from a bunch of beads or something. Rumi was a uh, Sufi mystic. And one reason that British Fabians and people like this like Sufis that Gould and Fitzgerald argue is that Rumi's mysticism fits into something that could be used by Anglo empirical Anglo American establishment Anglo empiricist elites. It's it's a very useful ideology, particularly in terms of tapping into and steering Islam. And yeah, there's other there's other sexual revolutionary issues as well with Rumi in regard to why the uh, British elite would have liked a dude like that. You can all figure out what I mean. But Rumi does, I remembered now that he does uh, come up in Goulden Fitzgerald's big book, um, which I read 10 years ago, Invisible Empire. I recommend this book if you're interested in, um, I'll, I'll pull up the interview for you guys on the history of Afghanistan from the perspective of Western geopolitical strategies. And this applies not just to the uh, British Empire, but also to America and why America had the strategy that it had in regard to Afghanistan and the war. And a lot of it has to do with drugs. And Sufis have a history of being involved in opium and the drug trade. I'm not saying every Sufi order was into that or every Sufi supports that. I'm just saying that there is historical uh, support and connection for this. Uh, for example, you'll notice here this article, Mystical Kabul. And from Kabul, words and images of war come our way. At a time of increasing violence, journalists, uh, blah, 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 they are seen here with the Sufi sex ecstatic ceremonies. In what he calls mystical Kabul, where the Sufi Tarigat Brotherhood moved to Zakir rhythms, and they uh, a practice later banned by the Taliban that he describes as a comeback of Sufi mysticism. The dervishes, uh, where they hug each other after a two-hour liturgy, during which several of them reach mystical states. Members of a Sufi order here prepare the opium pipe outside the shrine in Kabul during a mystical ceremony. Dervishes are lost in the power of the moment where participators in the Zakir are in an ecstatic ceremony where mystical Muslims practice this on a weekly basis. After the conclusion of the mystical ceremony in Kabul, the religious leader known as the doctor for his medical studies in Pakistan suggests a number of weeds and herbs to be boiled and ingested. He does getting high as hell, boy. They getting high as hell right up. Look at them dudes getting high as hell. Spinning around. Get high and spin. What you do at church? Get high and spin in a circle. Get real dizzy. Dang, dude. Do your church sound lit. My church is lit. Lit up with opium smoke, bro. Sufis perform the zikr ceremony. With a bunch of with a bunch of candy rings out of that candy machine where you put 50 cents in, you get a candy ring out. Uh, let's see what, I don't know what this is. Warlords, insignias, on and on and on. Um, anyway, we got into more depth specifically about this in Afghanistan here. You can go read about that there. Now, that does not mean that everybody in the Sufi orders was a Western intelligence agent. I'm not saying that. As we're actually going to see here in a moment with certain Brookings, there's Brookings Institute and Rand Corporation papers written about making more alliances with Sufi orders. But that's separate from covert use and connections with Sufi orders. That's a different thing. Why else, though, is theosophy and Sufism close in their shall we say, New World Order lineage in the 20th century. Well, part of the reason they're close together is that they both form a key influence on the New Age. And we'll look, in fact, at a couple articles uh, from Gould and Fitzgerald on that. But remember, Ratiu in his book notes, quote, 
Bernard Shaw's Fabian window, this was the idea of using Fabianism as part of the uh, British Royal Society strategy. He carried the logo with it, remold the world close to my heart's desire. So the, the goal of the Fabians was to remold, refashion and remold the world. This was a poem, quote, by the Muslim Omar Khayyam. Omar Khayyam was in vogue in the progressive faction of the British intelligentsia uh, at the time that the Fabians were writing. This is partly, this is significant because it is claimed that he is a follower and or was a follower of a group of uh, Muslims that called themselves Sufi. For many centuries, Sufism served as an instrument of softening, softening up non-Muslim pop, pop, populations for the later penetration of real Islam. Did you catch that? That's a key uh, text there in Rachu's book, page 108. Muslim Omar Khayyam wrote a poem, a Sufi poem, I will remold the world according to the heart's desire. The Fabian socialists took that poem as their motto. It's one of their mottos. Bernard Shaw's motto. And it's in the Fabian window. It's They put it into the stained glass window. The Sufi uh, motto. Now, why Sufism? Because it's a syncretistic version. It's a Neoplatonic syncretistic version. And Neoplatonism always functions as this um, sort of master key for when geopolitical elites want to have a superstructure religion, a skeletal superstructure that can tap into any religion. What's mystical Judaism? Kabbalism? What does that match up to? Neoplatonism, loosely speaking. Chinese alchemy, what does it match up to? Neo Neoplatonism, very loosely. Christian mysticism in many, many centuries. I'm talking about false Christian mysticism. What does it match up to? Neoplatonism. Originism, what is originism? Repackaged, rebranded Neoplatonism with a Christian veneer. Likewise, if you wanted to import and prepare a culture for Islam, you would bring in Neoplatonic Islam, a.k.a. Sufism. And that's precisely what Rajya says happened because that's exactly what happened and that makes perfect sense. Now, get this. It gets even crazier. If you would hit like and share, we've got 500 plus people and 167 likes. Come on, y'all. The topic is Sufism and how it's used and how it ties into the emerging world religion that's being promoted. And we're going to see it tie into the Abu Dhabi Faith Center. So you understand where I'm going with this, okay? I've already debated Trent Horn. What are you people even talking about? Seriously, like, go into the back catalog. Why are you here wasting everybody's time with your annoying comments and nothing that's nothing to do with what we're talking about do, do people not want to learn the real real history i mean the country is collapsing and going to shit because everybody just wants to be entertained just delete these people man just get them out of here i don't i'm no more patience for this this low IQ stuff. One of these key, one of these key figures, very close to Blavatsky, and the, the the pioneer for the erection of the coming world religion and for the entire United Nations UNESCO world program, especially the religious program that we're going to talk about, is the uh, figure of G.I. Gurdjieff. In fact, for many centuries, Sufism served as an instrument for softening up non-Muslim populations for the penetration of later of, of real Islam later. It was a godsend to the Fabians who liked to dabble in various mysticisms. They were keen supporters of alternative groups like Christian socialism, theosophy, and G.I. Gurdjieff's fourth way. Many of them also were interested in Freemasonry and members of the lodge. Fabians controlled culture and educate as they control culture and education. It became no coincidence that Sufism played a prominent role in the emergence of the New Age movement in the 1960s counterculture. The Fabians had actually pioneered this counterculture 
decades earlier in the 1900s. While Sidney Webb was serving as a chapman to the Technical Instruction Committee, Lord Ray, a former chairman of the London School Board and the University College and British Academy, all dominated by Fabians, instigated the creation, <coughs> creation of the British School of Oriental Studies in the University of London. The school was established in 1916 with Denison Ross, the professor of Persian and former principal of the Madras Muslim College in Calcutta, as its director. So we're beginning to see in the 19 in 1916 the importation of Islam and Islamic studies, particularly with Sufism. Other key in 1916, other key figures associated with the school was Professor of Arabic and Islamic Studies Sir Thomas Arnold. Sir Thomas Arnold had earlier written and taught at the Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College uh, and Governmental College and authored the book Preaching of Islam in 1896. So part of the reason that this was happening was that the British establishment was very interested in their uh, imperial strategy for how to, for example, try to control Mecca and how they would divvy up the Middle East. This is what they did when they divvied up and created countries like modern Iraq. Those are all creations of the British Empire, countries like, quote, Iraq. And also, again, if you've never seen the movie uh, Lawrence of Arabia, it's about what I'm talking about, right? He's a British intelligence agent. He goes over there, masters and lives the culture and then splits them up into various tribes uh, as it befits the British Empire. But they also wanted a strategy for controlling Mecca. And if you don't know, they created this figure uh, who met with Tiny Mustache Man. Uh, he's a made-up British intelligence guy who, who met with tiny mustache man you remember this guy the grand mufti that's him he's a literally a, a british intelligence created figure this guy and he actually looks like ryan gosling i'm not joking the grand mufti legit is ryan al gosling i mean look at that dude that's straight up ryan I'm starting to think Ryan Gosling is a clone of the British intelligence operative Amin Al Husseini, the Grand Mufti. I think he's the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Yes, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, right? Uh, is is literally a, a British created British intelligence agent, and this is on record. It's pretty well known in history. So this isn't a, cons a conspiracy. Yes, I know about Sykes Pico. I've lectured through uh, uh, Ingdahl's books. We talked about Sykes Pico, right? Sykes Pico is the divvying up of the Middle East by the British Empire, and so yes, this this guy is not just some random Islamic cleric. He's literally a British intelligence agent, and so he was kind of trying to make these deals right on behalf of uh, British Empire, so. Again, which all of these websites, by the way, are like, why is he talking to Tiny Mustache Man? And why is he hanging out with uh, Himmler? Because he's a British intelligence operative and British intelligence operatives were constantly working with those people. We just covered it in a recent stream. It's public history. Quigley has two whole chapters that I did that four hour debate. Did you guys not hear the four hour debate I did on this with all the caller people calling in? And we, we debated people with third position leanings, and we debated people with Marxist commie leanings. We went both ways. We swung both ways in that debate. Anyway. So where did I learn about all that? It's all in Ingdahl's books, by the way. The whole history of uh, the Grand Mufti and, and Tiny Mustache Man. That is in... Uh, Last Hegemon by Engel. So let's get back to these creeps over here. Remind you of this great uh, article written by Dr. Spence, which we'll look at in a minute. So Ratu was talking about the importation of Sufism and Rumi. And he gets more into Rumi here. He says, while at government college, Sir Thomas Arnold in the 18 uh, in the early 1900s who wrote this book on Islam 
so part of the nobility, preached, uh, promoted a guy named Muhammad Iqbal. Muhammad Iqbal was a lawyer who combined the teachings of the medieval Sufi, Sufi poet Rumi with Islamic revivalism. As president to the All India Muslim League, Iqbal pioneered the idea of a Muslim state in the 1930s and he collaborated with Fabian Society member Muhammad al Jannah in the creation of Pakistan. Pakistan also is created by the British Empire. Today's Pakistan is not an ancient country. It's created by the British Empire. Sufism and Islam were promoted by Arnold's disciple, Margaret Smith, at the University of London. While Fabian and uh, which Annie Besant was busy preaching theosophy, do you remember that we did a whole lecture on Annie Besant's 10-point plan to destroy the West and Christianity? Do you remember that? So you understand this is not just, oh, that's just some dumb witch that was hanging out with ugly-ass Blavatsky. No, no, no. No, you're way off. No, no. You don't understand. These are not dumb witches. They're dumb witches, but they have the full weight and power of the establishment behind them, you see. So this was some months back. It's a really important one if you if you missed it. I'm just going to remind you. Why am I always citing my stuff? Because a lot of this we cover over and over and over. And people don't know or they forget or they, they just don't listen to the back. Catalog. People are lazy. They don't go back through the back catalog. I mean, you understand how much information that is all sourced with the receipts and the documents that we put up here. Here it is right here. Uh, the 10 point new age takeover plan. This is Annie Besant's name plan right here. To take over and destroy Christianity with a lot of what we see going on today. So I would say she's pretty. she was pretty effective in a lot of her um, plans. They're not all, they, haven't, they haven't all come to pass. Uh, but feminism in the West and in Christianity, Skittles in Christianity, that's all part of her plan and it's all there. So she's been successful in uh, some of that. Um, now let's get back to Ratu. He says, Sufism and Islam were also point, uh, promoted at the University of London. Annie Besant was preaching theosophy and anti-British politics to the Indians. Various brands of reformed Islam were being planted in Britain. In 1913, another Indian lawyer named Kwaja Kamal Uddin established the Working Muslim Mission, <clears throat> which was instrumental in converting many Britons to Islam, including Lord Headley, <clears throat> who wrote <clears throat> A Western Awakening to Islam in 1914. So you see the British elites, the lords and ladies, are themselves beginning to convert and promote Islam. Now, as to how serious they were about these conversions, it's hard to say. <clears throat> maybe they were, maybe they were just doing their intelligence uh, work. Um, didn't St. John Philby also convert? This is Kim Philby's dad. Uh, yes. Look at him there. So again, around the same time of T.E. Lawrence is uh, St. John Philby, who is the famous Cambridge spy and traitor uh, Kim Philby, the Soviet. Kim Philby's dad another one of the most famous spies in the history of the British Empire, was St. John Philby, who was a British Arabist, who mastered and learned everything about Islam, <coughs> converted to Islam in 1930, and became advisor to King Ibn Saud. And so again, you can see how they were uh, working to, through intelligence networks, reorganize and set up the Middle East as per the British Empire. Oh, did you not know that Saudi Arabia is another creation of the British Empire? Also known as Jack Philby or Sheikh Abdullah, British Arabist, advisor, explorer, writer, and colonial intelligence officer. The father of Kim Philby of the Cambridge Spy Ring. 
You understand that your history is made by these people, by spies and intelligence operatives. And you don't know that because you're given a normie history. You're given a public sanitized washed down history. And so you don't know about Harry St. John Philby. And you don't know that Kipling wrote a novel about him. Right, isn't it? Wasn't Kipling's novel called Kim? I think. Is that right? The novel is not about the son, Kim. The novel is about the father, right? Isn't that right? Let me see if I'm right about that. I'm going from memory. Maybe it's a poem. Is it a poem or a book? It is. I'm, I am correct. Little Kim. David Gilmore on the Indian stories and poems. Are, no, we don't want David Gilmore's opinion. Uh, yes, it's the Kipling novel about... Correct. Kipling's novel about uh, Russia and... I've not read this novel, so I'm just going from memory. <clears throat> but it... It comes up in the literature or not a lot. <clears throat> the allergies drive me crazy. It's like the highest allergies of the whole summer today in Florida. <clears throat> it's rough. Kim is a novel by Rudyard Kipling, blah, blah, blah. The story unfolds as a backdrop of the, uh, uh, of the great game, the popular conflict between Russia and Britain and Central Asia. The novel popularized the phrase and the idea of the great game and <clears throat> the figure Kim relates to St. John Hunt, I think, but look, and this is quite uh, common in Kipling novels because it's in the man who would be King, which is the movie with Michael Caine and Sean Connery by chance. Kim's father's regimental chaplain identifies Kim by his Masonic certificate. Again, because Freemasonry was, for the British Empire, uh, part of their intelligence network. Anyway, now, this isn't telling me that it's based on... Um, it has some relation to Rudyard Kipling. I mean, to St. John Philby, because uh, there's a book by a guy on a British spy fiction that mentions this book and its relationship to uh, St. John Philby. Anyway, so yeah, just, just delete all these people that are haters. Just get them out of here. <clears throat> I mean, I've been in the midst of responding to absolute goobers for the last two weeks straight. So, so getting back to theosophy and Neoplatonism, uh, we're talking about these lords and ladies pushing it. And then it says that in 1916, the London Sufi Order of the West was created by a guy named Hazrat Inayat Khan who taught that the prophet Muhammad brought a divine message of democracy. The book is called the Sufi message of Hazrat and Yat Khan. HG Wells could not have said it better. First of all, no, uh, Islam and Muhammad are not teaching democracy, utterly ridiculous propaganda, but you can see the strategy here. Following the footsteps of Khan was Idris Shah, the chief architect of the Sufi deception in Britain and elsewhere. <clears throat> in what must have been one of the greatest hoaxes of history, this Indian-born imposter, made out to be in possession of secret gnosis, launched a massive worldwide campaign to promote himself and his Sufi mystical teachings, was led, which he fed millions of gullible Westerners with through the help of his press, Octagon Press, a publishing house that was set up in 1960. In 1965, he set up a... Uh, Institute called the Institute for Cultural Research. It had the main function of promoting Islamic culture. Another Shah outfit was the Society for Sufi Studies. 
Shaw's main promoters in Britain were a clique of influential left-wing radicals with connections to the Fabians and their subversive counterculture. It included Sir Robert Graves, the fiction writer and friend of Edward Carpenter, as well as other leading Fabians, Dora Lessing, Doris Lessing, and a mix of crowds, a mix from the crowd of Fabians in the Left Book Club before progressing to communism and Sufism. He also contributed to Shaw's Institute for Cultural Research. I'm talking about Doris Lessing. So, you know, a lot of these neoconservatives will talk about the Islamo-fascist leftist uh, uh, alliance. Uh, it's not fascism, but there is a leftist Islamic alliance that actually does exist. So the, the conservative goobers and uh, neocons are not completely wrong about this, but they're completely wrong to think that it's Islamo-fascism. No, it's Fabian socialism that aligned itself 100 years ago with perennialism and Sufism, which prepared the way for the Islamicization of, Islam, of London to literally be Londonistan. I've been to London. I went a few years ago and I lectured there. It is Londonistan. And that is not without the okay and decision of the elite. Nothing to do with the British people. Britain is a test bed for Europe in many ways similar to how New York and L.A. or the East Coast and the West Coast are kind of test beds for what they try to push on the rest of America. In the U.K., what happens in uh, Londonistan becomes the model for them what they push through the rest of Europe. And it doesn't matter ultimately that there was Brexit. The, I mean, yes, Brexit was in one sense a rejection of an existing system. But it's not like, oh, now based in trad England. Yeah, right. Give me a freaking break. That was a plan. I'm talking about not Brexit, but I'm talking about the Islamicization was a plan that would then be pushed on the rest of Europe by design. And it was it was figured out hundred years ago by these people. These are the people that planned it. This whole chapter is great on that. Just as in the pre-war generation, they had been brainwashed into believing that capitalism was dead and now socialism was inevitable. In other words, the promised kingdom of communism was coming in the post-war generation and would be subjected then to Fabian Shaw propaganda and the machine to create thousands of pro-Sufi publications, articles, lectures, academic courses, seminars, workshops, all pushed from the elite British institutions. You see, in the 1930s, is that what you're talking about? Post, Post-World War One? Yeah. Well, 1920s. 1920s all the way up until the 1980s. Western civilization was said to be inferior and dead, and it was in need of being saved by Sufism and Islam. Once the culturally uprooted and confused intellectual classes who were still under the effect of the opium of Marxism and Fabianism had been softened up by the massive pro-Sufi propaganda, the door was now open to Islam to penetrate all of British society at will. A prime example of the success of this campaign is shown in Prince Charles's overt support for Islam beginning in the 1980s. And if you've never seen it, people get confused of the Prince Charles is orthodox because he took a picture one time with a uh, icon, so he's secretly orthodox. Yeah, right. Are you kidding? How stupid and naive are you people? Um, there's a picture of him with a scimitar where he's being initiated, I think, into a Sufi order. Yeah. Look at that. King Charles. The UK's most pro-Islam monarch. What? Uh-uh. What? 
yeah, here he is with his uh, Simtar here with the uh, Saudis. Yep. There's another one <laughs> wearing its costumes. Spirited Saudi sword dance. Doing his little Masonic pose there. That's because he's a perennialist. All right. So Sufism prepared the way for Islamicization of the rest of Europe via first London and the UK. A large percentage of Muslims uh, came to England in the 1950s and 60s from areas like Pakistan, Kashmir, and East Africa. They made no attempt to assimilate or become Christians in Britain's pseudo-Christian population. Why would they? Fabian policies thus resulted in the opening of the borders and the planning uh, by social engineers and technocrats to completely change and restructure British society. This restructuring of society was actually mentioned by Tony Blair's advisor, admitted to be Blair the Open Fabian's plan for the policy of making Britain more multicultural. This multiculturalization was a deliberate plan that the Labour Party instituted through mass immigration through more and more, quote, multiculturalism. In the academic field, the promotion of Islam can be traced back to Fabian-dominated institutions like Oxford University. Oxford played a key role in setting up the Center for Islamic Studies, the School of Oriental African Studies, the Center of Islamic Studies at the University of London, and incredibly, SOAS and departments like this actually ran undergraduate and postgraduate programs teaching courses in Sufism. You can go to their website now and it reads, the primary expression of Muslim mysteries and spirituality is Sufism. It is indispensable for going deeper in understanding Islam. That's on the university's websites, the courses you can take in becoming a Sufi mystic. These, this is British intelligence universities, you see. Sufism crops up in LSC circles as well, the London School of Economics, the Fabians. In 2005, Sufi websites were launched by Walid Ka Walid Khalid at the London School of Economics, 2012. In 2011, Interfaith Week promoted LSC students at the un their union paper, The Beaver, having co-religious uh, ceremonies with Sufis and Muslims. Muslims love God and achieve closeness to him. Sounds like Nostra Tate Vatican II, doesn't it? Interfaith ecumenism was thus key to promoting the enculturation and multiculturalism that destroyed London. Did you hear that? Interfaith ecumenism was crucial to this plan to destroy England. The identity of Sufism in the form propagated by the likes of the phony Shah and with Islam and let me, let me restart this over. In the form of propaganda of the likes of Shah, with Islam explains why much of it has been, why much has been made of the claim that Shah belonged to a male under descent from the Prophet Muhammad. That's a fraud. That's not true. Sufi publications, including Shah's own, are peppered with Arabic phrases and terms in references to Islam, Muhammad, and the Quran. The pro Islamic agenda is uncontrovertibly demonstrated by the Sufi apologist's vehement denial of the patent fact that Islamic philosophy borrows heavily from Aristotle. Exactly what we argued in the uh, Azra Rashid debate, and Azra Rashid didn't even know that all of these ideas that he thought were coming from the Quran and Islamic philosophy are from Aristotle. No, no, med medieval Islamic philosophy didn't come out of the Quran. It's from Aristotle and the Greeks. Indeed, most of the elements of, quote, Islamic culture and science and architecture are adopted wholesale from non-Arab uh, cultures like Byzantium and Hellenic ideas like the Greeks. It was later subjugated by Islam, and thus Sufi teachings are actually based on Christian Neoplatonic, Christianized Neoplatonic traditions. Being the dominant religion at the time, 
these were hijacked by Muslim rulers in the 8th and 9th century to give a veneer of spirituality and respectability to Islam. And now that we've engaged in four or five years of Islamic debates, we can absolutely <laughs> say that that's true. Uh, it's a giant fraud religion. One of the most ridiculous frauds ever when you get into things like the hadiths. So what's the point of all this, though? Sufism may plant a root in a culture, and that is the argument of Shah, Idris Shah. Exactly what kind of root is planted is really the key to understanding the retreat of Christianity and the allowance for the cultural hegemony of Islam that first begins with Sufism, which later gives way to real, hardcore, authentic Islam. Like all the other key British institutions, the Fabians founded the London School of Economics and its International Relations Department by Fabian Socialist Lord Haldane and his friend Lord Rothschild Associate Sir Ernst Kassel. The European Institute has been running research courses, seminars, workshops, lectures on advanced thinking about how to bring about more Islamic enculturation in uh, the EU and in the UK. The Center for Middle Eastern Studies was added to the LSE arsenal. The pro-Islamic strand stand of such institutions is demonstrated by their vast sums of money from the various Islamic regimes around the world, from, is from Libya to the Arabs and so forth, all of whom are absolutely hostile to the West. LSE's Global Migration Institute, run by Peter Sutherland, is a key element to the Islamicization of Europe. In her expose, Eurabia, Bakhtiyeor correctly identifies the 19th century Arab oil embargo, resulting in a pressure point put by Arab oil producing states, oil producing Arab states on oil independent countries as a key event. This triggered the Islamicization process. In fact, it was uh, people like Kissinger that played a key role in that. And the elements initiating the driving of the Islamicization process were exactly those that the Milner Fabians wanted. The pro-Arab EEC was a Fabian socialist dominated organization that had a Fabian socialist agenda. That is, to Islamicize the UK and the West. Thus, if you are familiar with Samuel P. Huntington, this is intended to exploit the clash of civilizations. And the Fabian socialists believe openly that Islam is a tool in their chessboard, in their chess pieces, in their chess piece arsenal against Western civilization and Christianity. Socialism hopes to socialize Islam in the same way that it has socialized Christianity. They believe that it's a tool. Okay. Bertrand Russell doesn't believe in Islam. I don't think Prince Charles, King Charles, believes in Islam. The Islamicization, however, of Britain can only be properly understood as part of the Fabian drive to dilute and eventually eliminate Western civilization by means of, in Europe, Islamicization. And then he goes on to other uh, Islamic operations, and he says this actually explains why, from 1997 to 2010, labor was key in the UK to completely Islamicization of London, making it Londonistan. And that was a key thing that Blair did. And this ties into why there's so many connections between British intelligence and the Muslim Brotherhood, ISIS, and all of that. You, are you understanding now how it works today? Same networks, same British intelligence operatives. And Ratu, of which is a few, few writers out there, was able to understand and pick this up. <clears throat> in 1998 under Fabian Minister Tony Blair MI6 was instructed to train and arm the Kosovo Liberation Army I've already lectured on this I lectured on it 8 or 9 years ago in the uh, when we lectured through Mark Curtis's Secret Affairs now do you think Mark Curtis is a conspiracy theorist no he is the Royal Institute for International Affairs Islamic writer. That's his expertise. 
And of course it doesn't come up anymore because nothing comes up in searches. Why should it come up in searches? We don't want people finding this actual real historical information. You could go argue with idiots on Twitter. Why does it not come up? I have a freaking talk on it. Hmm. Maybe I moved it. Did I move it to? Hmm. Oh, wait a minute. It's titled something different and you can never find it unless you get the exact title right. What did I title that? Devil's Game and Secret Affairs. That's it. It's two in one, I think. Let's see if we can find it this way. There it is. Okay, here's Devil's Game. And then here's Secret Affairs. There it is. Okay, I didn't put it in the title, I guess. That's why. So here is part of this. Is this this is, might be an old members talk. All right, well, I'm not giving you that if that's a members talk. Sorry for that. So y'all don't get access to the members talk. But uh, I did cover uh, Mark Curtis's entire book, Secret uh, Affairs. And that's, he actually, I think he, I think he cites Curtis in this book, but because Curtis has a whole chapter on the Kosovo Liberation Army being a CIA British intelligence creation where they basically used these Al-Qaeda operatives that had a bunch of communist uh, philosophy and they created this group. So CIA MI6 under Clinton and Blair was using the Kosovo Liberation Army uh, as a proxy force to fight Serbia. Right. And you, you notice that it's very similar to. Yeah. KLA fighters clash with the Serbs. And this is part of the Clinton bombing of Kosovo and Serbia and all that. But, uh, this, this radical Islamic group is one of these groups that's used by Western intelligence because they created it. Just like they run and use a lot of these networks. And it was, they even set up the, uh, the ISI, the Pakistani ISI is set up by the CIA and British intelligence. General Mahmoud. Do you know about that? Anyway, so that whole chapter, this is why, by the way, uh, you have the Muslim mayor. Is he still the mayor? I don't know. Uh, Sadiq Khan. Uh, isn't, isn't he the one saying that Britons need to turn off their heat and stop driving? That's going to get into where we're going. Yeah, he's, he's the mayor of London. This guy. He's the one that's uh, behind all the, the cameras being set up everywhere. And wasn't he the one uh, saying that you need to stop driving and you need to turn off your car? All this nonsense. Remember this guy? Can you guess what his political philosophy is? Fabian. Fabian Socialist. Let's see. I think, wasn't he put it, pushing the 15 minute city stuff? Do y'all remember? You know what I'm talking about? Yes, he was. I am correct. Fifty-minute cities as part of London's recovery. Sadiq Khan. Um, I mean, this guy's unbelievable, right? He's like 
total, uh, you know, New World Order, like total, total WEF Klaus character. C40 cities. That's right. That's what I'm looking for. Well, C40 is 97 cities with populations north of 700 million, more than a quarter of the globe's uh, GDP. And what countries can do by looking at the action of our members is see the progress we are making. We've shown that we are movers, we are doers. We're taking action, reducing carbon emissions, reducing air pollution, creating green jobs and leading the way. So here he is talking about, and what are C40 cities? Do you know, you guys have seen this, right? This is the cities where they want to ban meat and ban driving. And this will be a great transition to where we want to go. So you're saying this is, this is the great reset right here. Harness the power of C40 cities. Now, remember they were saying, uh, what, 15 minutes ago or 15, uh, well, not talking 15 minutes ago. I'm tired. Uh, we were out in the sun all day long, so my mind is my mind is like mush from being in the sun all day. Like two weeks ago, they were saying that there's no such well, thing C40. as C40 cities. That's a conspiracy theory that doesn't exist. And because they were saying that the C40 cities were talking about banning meat, right? And uh, that you don't need to drive cars. Yes, C40 cities banning cars. Now, they said this is a conspiracy theory, even though they have a website saying that they want to get to where there's no cars and there's no meat. It's not there yet. They're not going to ban meat. They want to do it down the road, <laughs> the road, you see. Here it is. C40 cities want to ban meat, dairy, and driving a car. Now, again, it's on their website. This is a website critical of it, a libertarian website criticizing it. But it's on their website. Right here. C40 cities. This is the plan for where they want to go. So they're just lying and saying, when they put it out there, they say, we're not banning me and telling you that you can't drive your car. We're saying that's what we want 10 years from now. See how they lie and they do this, play this game? But here it is right here, C40 Cities. This is their document, their website. By the way, uh, if you want to support my show, you can via the Streamlabs feature right here. We've only had a couple super chats. I mean, I'm giving you guys like, who else is going into the history of intelligence agencies and Sufis? I've never seen anyone cover this on a podcast. There probably is a podcast somewhere. I'm not saying that nobody's ever covered it. But, I mean, we've got 700 people in here and we've had two Super Chats. So, is everybody just, like, stingy all of a sudden? Nobody wants to support the show anymore? What's going on? I mean, I guess we'll just have to make every podcast half and half if that's if we're not going to get any more Super Chats. 700, over 700 people watching and only 394 likes. So... Again, it's, I guess it's what you guys want. If you guys don't want me to be here doing this, we won't do it. Rumi and Sufism, as we said, we already covered that. C40 cities, there you go. I did want to mention this because this is Gould and Fitzgerald who did the uh, Invisible Empire that I interviewed seven or eight years ago when I read their book. Throughout their book, the authors demonstrate an attempt to explain the behavior in terms of mystical religious incentives. Early on, they draw the line of ideas from Zoroaster who lived in Central Asia for over a thousand over a thousand years before Christ up to the Reagan Bush era and recent generations. The parallel the authors draw between Zoroaster and the cosmology of light versus dark and the American rhetoric of good versus evil. You notice this Manichaean dialectic, right? That goes back to Zoroastrianism. This is all part of the Hegelian dialectic and process philosophy that we've been covering uh, for the last week or so since we've interacted with those demonic insane marxists to support their strained connection between the ancient past and contemporary affairs the authors find mysticism and sacred agendas throughout history afghanistan has indeed be and did indeed been the home of a number of mystical movements the rashiana cult which they refer to and many sufi orders 
And this is one example of a famous British spy, Noor Anayat Khan, who worked for the Special Operations Executive, the British intelligence outfit, as a Sufi. And they utilized her Sufi connections, Sufi networks, to make her a spy as a Sufi against Tiny Mustache Man. Thank you for those super chats. Appreciate you guys. She was the daughter of an Indian Sufi mystic. She gave her life as a British intelligence agent, agent fighting with the French resistance for the cause of freedom. Now, 76 years later, Noor Inayat Khan was captured by the Gestapo. Oh, so she's a martyr for women's rights. Right. She was involved in the Allied landing of D-Day, codenamed Madeline. She became a high-value target. They caught her because she liked to wear blue and she didn't fit in. The book is titled Madeline, Sufi Spy in Tiny Mustache Occupied Paris. He believes that she may have uh, written in 1943 that while she was being trained by the SOE and espionage, sabotage, and renaissance, she knew nothing about shooting of guns before that. She was a peaceful activist. So she, she's a martyr for uh, feminism and all this kind of stuff. So you can read about her right there as an example, as an example of British intelligence operations and the usage of Sufis. Now let's look at a Rand Corporation paper as another example of attitudes to where Rand says, cultivate more working with more alliances with Sufis. Sufis are not a ready match for any of these above categories. We include them in modernism. Sufism represents an open intellectual interpretation of Islam. Sufi influence over school curricula norms and cultural life should be strongly encouraged in countries that have Sufi traditions, such as Afghanistan and Iraq. Through its poetry, music, and philosophy, Sufism is a strong bridge and a role outside of, has a role outside of religious affairs. Islamic radicalism and its manifestations right, are different when we look at like Sufi, Salafi, Wahhabi, all that kind of stuff. Rather, uh, Sufism is a key inroad right, through Western liberalism. But you understand it works both ways because the Fabian said we can also import Islam in this seemingly harmless mystical branch first that ripens everyone up for the full-on real Islam. And so you can even see that there's another Brookings Institute report that I have which says the same thing. Uh, I'm not going to pull that. You can pull up Sufism, Brookings Institute report. Let's see if we want to see that. There's a couple more things I want to talk about Sufism before we move on. I forgot. Positive branding and soft power. This is it from Brookings Institute, one of the more premier think tanks in the United States. It's up there with Rand. It's up there with uh, Carnegie Endowment, all, the, all these big think tanks, right? Brookings is one of the top ones. Since the beginning of the global war on terror, Saudi-inspired Wahhabism has been scrutinized worldwide for being synonymous with hatred and intolerance. Conversely, Sufism has come to be seen as Gentile moderate Islam, uh, an alternative and a tool of counter-terrorism policies in many Muslim-majority countries. Indeed, it is also brought to the fore in U.S. policymaking as an ideological bulwark against extremism. But again, this isn't even looking into the fact that the Western intelligence agencies are the ones that aided, empowered, and brought ISIS to, to, to uh, Syria, brought ISIS into these conflicts uh, all of the other uh, radical groups were aided and used by Western intelligence, Kosovo Liberation Organization, right? Army. A pop as a popular instrument of religious soft power and the positive branding of Islam, Sufism has been used by state and non-state actors to influence through attraction and persuasion. Oh, you mean like the Fabian Socialists? Exactly. So... Sufism is key for promoting and branding, as they say here, crafting and promoting a good moderate Islam. So it's a branding exercise, as the Brookings Institute says right there. If 
you would hit like and share it, we are working our way through. Now, this was another reminder that just like Sufism, Theosophy, and its connections to intelligence are ultimately very clearly evident in the character of Blavatsky, who was a go-between with a lot of Western intelligence and the Soviets. Nicholas Rorick takes Theosophy to America as a Soviet, and he was very close to Madame Blavatsky. And so uh, Spence's thesis is that Blavatsky's ascended masters that she was going to meet with were her handlers. So here is the Richard Spence, Dr. Spence. And we did an entire interview with Dr. Spence. Not Richard Spencer, Dr. Richard Spence, and not Robert Spencer. Crowley and British intelligence. His excellent book is Secret Agent 666, which we covered right here with Dr. Richard Spence. So if you've not watched this or listened to this interview, it's one of our classics. Be sure and go listen to that. Also get the book. Secret Agent 666 and Shambhala. And you'll notice the Shambhala connection and the Himalayas and all that esoteric stuff. Uh, that's precisely, again, uh, espionage stuff. Right? Remember that we covered the czars. The great game in Tibet. Everyone at this time knew and understood, as Mark Hackard shows here. This is, again, Blavatsky time, right? That these missions that are under occult cover are actually for spy craft. They're spy work. It's spying. Now, some people believe in the esoteric jibber-jabber. Himmler probably, probably really believed in that when he took his secret mission to the Himalayas and all that. But a lot of this has to do with intelligence operations. So, again, if you don't know that, you don't know anything. So please learn these things. Please figure these things out or we're never going to get anywhere. All right. Thank you guys for those generous super chats. I appreciate that. It's already over. Uh-oh. It's already over. Now, we're coming up to the modern. Oh, one last thing about Sufi stuff I found here I did want to look at. This is a classic essay from Ingdahl from uh, nine years ago. Again, Ing Ingdahl is a, a crucial analyst that we draw very heavily from. If you want to understand the vantage point from which I'm coming, uh, a lot of it is from Ingdahl's books. He's one of the best. I don't agree with everything F. William Ingdahl says. But he's got some of the best analysis. I think he makes some mistakes here and there. So have I, though. Right? Nobody's going to get all of this right, especially when we get into the deep geopolitics. right? But here's an old classic essay that Hackard reminded me of from Ingdahl from 2014. Getting into the history of the rise of ISIS. And we're going to notice something very fascinating. We are told that ISIS masked psychopaths captured arms and ammunitions from various fleeing security forces. These arms and ammunitions were supplied by the United States government. The offensive of ISIS coincides with the successful campaign in eastern Syria. This is what I was just mentioning a minute ago, the importation of ISIS to Syria. According to Iraqi journalists, Sunni tribal chiefs in the region had been convinced to side with ISIS against the Shiite al-Maliki government in Baghdad. They were promised a better deal under... ISIS and Sunni Sharia than with the Baghdad anti-Sunni rule. According to the New York Times, the mastermind behind the ISIS military success is the former Ba'athist party head and Saddam Hussein successor, General Ibrahim al-Dori. Dori is reportedly the head of the Iraqi rebel group, the Army of the Men of the Nashkbandi Order. 
That's a Sufi order. As well as the Supreme Commander of Jihad Liberation, based on his longstanding positions of leadership in the Nashkbandi sect of Iraq. And I have read years ago, and I cannot find it where I read it, but I read years ago that Nashkbandis were also connected to either the CIA or British intelligence in regard to, I think, drug running, if I recall. So here is this old Ingdahl article. Uh, again, amazing recollection from Mark Hackard on this one. I'm always impressed, impressed with his academic scholarly skills. But let's check the, the, the men, army of the men of the Nashkabandi order. Let's see what we get if we look that up. Underground Baathist Sufi militant insurgency group in Iraq. Wow. Talk about bizarre. By the way, uh, if you don't remember, the Baathists were originally trained and set up by the CIA. They were uh, a secular uh, pan-Arab nationalist approach that the CIA had in the early days of the Cold War. Miles Copeland has a whole book on this. We've lectured through that whole book, Game of Nations. How are we getting so many weirdos in here? Like we're having to delete like constant weirdos in here. Does today's topic just attract the weirdos? I don't get it. But uh, this is some really fascinating stuff. So again, you really can't understand any of this jibber-jabber and all these different groups until you understand the imperial geostrategic and intelligence backgrounds. When you understand the intelligence angles, I'm not saying I have them at all figured out. Nobody does. You can always learn more about this stuff. But if you get this down... You really understand the logic and the motivations of all the different players. That's what I'm trying to say. The Army of the Men of the Nashkabandi Order is a so-called Nashkabandi Army as a underground Baathist, originally trained by the CIA, and then the CIA, when they chose the radical Islamic approach to the Middle East, they discarded the older Pan-Arab plan. That, again, the whole book on it, Game of Nations, we lectured the whole book. One of the underground Baathist Sufi militant insurgency groups in Iraq. Media frequently refers to them as JRTN. The Supreme Command for Jihad Liberation is technically the name of the umbrella organization. It is named for the Nashkabandi Sufi Order. And it was headed up by Izzat Ibrahim al-Duri. The hidden sheikh of the men of Nashkabandi. So here's the hidden imam playing on this goofy Islamic myth of the hidden imam. And let's look at the Nashkabandi order. Pan-Iranian Tariq of Sunni Islam, named from the Iranian Sayyid Baha Uddin Nashkabandi Bukhari. Nashkabandi masters traced their lineage to Muhammad through Abu Bakr, the first caliph of Sunni Islam, the fourth caliph, and Ali, the fourth caliph. It is because of this dual lineage through Ali and Abu Bakr that through the sixth Imam Jafir al Sadiq, the order is known as the Convergence of the Two Oceans, the Sufi Order Jafar al Sadiq. This reminds me of the what's the what's the group in uh, uh, Last Crusade? <laughs> what's the name of that group in Last Crusade? Anyway, uh, I would bet you money this is a Western intelligence run group. I mean, uh, the Ingdahl article is basically saying that. So. According to the New York Times, the mastermind behind the ISIS military success is the former Baathist and Saddam Hussein's successor, Ibrahim al-Dhuri, supposedly the head of the army of the men of the Nashkbandi order. Okay, yeah. So that would be essentially 
aligned with most likely Western intelligence. So there you go. I mean, probably run out of British intelligence, right? A lot of the Muslim stuff like that's kind of a older British intelligence run stuff. Uh, so here is Ingdahl's article, if you want to read that. Okay, thank you for telling me how to pr uh, properly pronounce it. Good God. I mean, we have like the most spurgy people in our audience. We also have the smartest people in our audience. But we also have this the Spurgat Spurgatron 5000s in the audience too. Now, don't forget either that Bergoglio, we're going to switch over a little bit here now that we've done a lot of Sufi stuff. Don't forget that Bergoglio, Pope Francis, was already aligned with the Western power structure in the Cold War during the Argentine Dirty War known as Operation Condor. Operation Condor was one of the CIA operations to fight against uh, supposedly liberation theology and communism. And you might say, well, well, wait a minute. Francis seems to be a fan of liberation theology. Yes, in fact, when he was elected, they were calling him the liberation theologian. The Rome has elected as their new pope the liberation theologian. And yet he was responsible for helping to jail and imprison and eventually T-O-R-T-U-R-E various people that were uh, against the death squads and regimes in his region. So he aligned himself with the CIA, with the military junta, and was working to crush liberation theology. And then, oh, now all the trads, oh, based trad. Oh, he's a based and trad. No, 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 he's not based and trad. He's above that dialectic. Because who's his mentor? Uh, his mentor, excuse me, Klaus's mentor, is the good friend of Pope Francis, Dom Helder Camara. Who is Dom Helder Camara? One of the famous liberation theologians. So again, you understand liberation theology, Latin America, CIA, KGB, Cold War, we're, we're beyond all that. Because now we're moving into the synthesis phase after the Cold War. So here is the essay from this substack. And why, why would I say that? Well, because now what Francis is pushing is all the same stuff that Klaus and company are pushing. And he even wrote, Francis wrote a letter to Klaus. And you'll notice that Francis is saying and echoing all the same things that the WEF and Davos say. Francis rebukes the irresponsible U.S. on climate change. Because we need to be more like China. China is the model, you see. Based in trad. And what did he say over here? In the dubia? Remember what he said? Touching ding-dongs or hot dogs might not be, quote, marriage, but it's a form of union that's partial and analogous to marriage. And in some cases can be blessed. Remember that clowns like Michael Lofton were saying that none of this is true. It hasn't happened. Let's see what Tim says about what all this means. And let's see what Tim says about Michelle Lofton. You're saying, I don't know, so what's some other heresy? Satan is the brother of our Lord? Like the Mormons believe? What? Wait, what? That's what a doobie is. It means doubt. It's a wait, what? Can you clarify this? Did you just say that you're talking crazy? That's it. That's what a dubium is. Wait, what? And it's not a but. It's a what. It's not a but. It's a what. Now, the but, as you know, is always introduced by Francis, who loves the but. B-U-T. He is the ultimate but philosopher. Okay? But, B-U-T. And this is what his responses to the five dubia, I'm not going to recover these. 
was all, well, here's the faithful, timeless teaching of the church for 2,000 years, and here it is, and I don't seek to change that, but we're going to study it, and we are going to change it. <laughs> he loves the butt so much, and the Sankt Gallen Mafia have oriented their entire goal, Episcopal goal, prelatial goal, ecclesiastical goal, all around the butt. They're trying to change the teachings with the butt. Okay, so this got overshadowed until yesterday, where now um, Amor Satitia is part of the magisterium. Sorry, Michael Lofton. Do any of you guys listen to Pope Splainers like Michael Lofton still? Do you know all this guy said? Do you know how much he vitiated himself? He used to be a good scholar. On Amoris Laetitia alone, I think he left the church because of it when he was overreacting to some true truth about Amoris Laetitia. It means Francis is changing an irreformable teaching. You could give communion to the divorce and civilly remarried. The guy can't deal. He can't deal with reality. Play the ball as it lies. It is part of the magisterium. He has said, guys like Mr. Lofton has said dozens of times over the last seven years, Amoris Laetitia is not part of the magisterium. Duca, in this dubium, not the five dubia, but the other dubia on Amoris Laetitia, it was already crystal clear. This one didn't even need to be asked. This doubt did not even need to be addressed. So notice this. This is... This is what Michael Lofton hinged the last seven years of his Pope explaining on. That this document where Francis allows divorcees and remarried people to to commune, which prepares the way for where we are now with his synod on synodality. Michael says, Hey dog, it ain't part of the magisterium, dog. It ain't magisterial. Listen to Tim totally deconstruct this ridiculous thing that Lofton has hinged seven years on. He asked whether Pope Francis' response to the bishops of Buenos Aires in September, October of 2016, six months after Amoris Laetitia came out in April 2016, um, can be considered a statement of the ordinary magisterium of the church. Is Francis taking his letter to the Buenos Aires bishops in October of 2016 when the Pope stated there was no other interpretation of Amoris except the one provided by the bishops of Buenos Aires, allowing communion for the divorced and remarried. Is this part of the magisterium? Francis put it into the Acta Apostolicae Sedis. So the answer is yes. That's been news for seven years now. It's October 23. In October of 16, seven years ago, we had full access to this. Francis stuck it into the AAS, the Acta Apostolicae Sedis, and it was part of the magisterium. And guess what Pope Splainers have been saying for seven years? They've been saying, no, it's not really part of the magisterium. Well, Dominic Duca issued this other dubium, not part of the five issued by the five dubia brothers, that got overshadowed by that initially. And here's the answer. I'm reading from LifeSite. Fernandez wrote, the DDF, number two in the church doctrinally, wrote that since Francis's words were published in the Vatican's official compilation of documents, the Acta Apostolicae Sedes, they were authentic magisterium. You can either listen now, ironically, paradoxically, to Pope explaining truth stretchers like Michael Lofton. Liars who say it's not part of the magisterium, or you can listen to your doctrinal chief, Tucho Fernandez, who wants to heal you with his big, gross mouth. You can listen. You have to listen to Tucho. You might not want to. I wish, would to God, that Michael Lofton was right, were right. Would to God that Michael Lofton's 40 chess, wishful thinking arrangement of fairy tale mental gymnastic hypothetical math worked out but guess what it doesn't exactly 
and that's because he's been wrong the entire time, and he's a fragile creep who can't handle anybody criticizing him. He has a freaking meltdown with one person saying that even if they agree with him and they criticize him, he has a complete meltdown. So, you know, this is what we've been saying about Michael Lofton for years, and now it's all finally coming out. I can't fathom why anyone still follows this this goblin, but they do. Um, but I'm going to let Tim continue a little bit more here. It's part of the magisterium. That's irreformable teaching. Francis changed irreformable teaching. Let me put it more bl Did you hear that? So now Tim's admitting Francis changed irreformable teaching. What was everything we were told about the papacy as its selling point function for us? Why we need to be Roman Catholic and leave Orthodox, quit being schismatics? Because we would have a guide to preserve unity clarity make decisions and distinctions and give us irreformable teachings what did tim just say that's irreformable teaching francis changed irreformable teaching let me francis changed irreformable teaching and that change he just said is now magisterium that's irreformable teaching francis changed irreformable teaching let me put it more bluntly francis has reformed irreformable teaching tim what, a, um, what does this mean i don't know i'm Sorry. just giving you a fact go ahead it means that the orthodox church's criticisms a thousand years ago about what we saw in dictatus pape are vindicated Now, you're going to understand why we why we went from Sufism to Frank and Klaus and Davos here in a second. But I'm just trying to show you that these big geopolitical moves and changes and where they want to steer the world, it's actually in the literature what they want to do and what the plans are. It's not up in the air. Now, we don't know every chess move they're going to make. What the plan is, and how that plan has transpired from the 1800s into the 20th century, it's in the history books. It's in the memoirs of the spies. It's in the big geopolitical tomes that we cover. It's in the writings of the elite that we cover, like Klaus and like Jacques Attali. And it's in the people who write the, quote, conspiracy books like John Coleman. Or like Anthony Sutton. Anthony Sutton says the exact same thing in that book that John Coleman says. That the Western oligarchical elite made their money from the opium trade. The British Empire was a front for a giant opium racket. And today's American elite through the OSS and the CIA, adopted the exact same strategy and plan via Paul Heliwell and the use of organized crime for the opium networks and trade. That's the old British imperial model. Are you noticing a pattern here? America adopts the old British imperial strategies. Use terrorists, use Sufis, use Islam, use all of these things. Use the drug trade to fund your black ops. All of this is in the books. And it's over and over and over in the books. Dictatus Pape. Now, in this talk by Tim, which was a good podcast, he quotes Cardinal Burke saying that the papacy never taught that the papacy can change dogma. Or that it can reform the irreformable. Or that it can make up new laws like this. Oh, actually, it does right here. The Pope alone, for him, it, it alone is lawful according to the needs of the times to make new laws. And the immediate context of Dictatus Pape is the Gregorian reforms and the complete restructuring of the ecclesiology of the church entirely in the West. 
away from the synodal model to the Pope now confirms every bishop in the world. Total revolution in the church, church governance. And when Roman Catholics learn this, they immediately say, well, doctrine devolves. Yeah, sure, it develops. The Pope always had that power, but he didn't always exercise it. It was always there, but it grew into a tree, blah, 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 blah. Why are you so mean? Why are you so mean? I'm not mean to these people. These people are ridiculous people. Now, I mean, I've been dealing with these people for Ibarra almost a decade. I mean, we're, we're getting close to... I started interacting with Ibarra in 2013. So, I mean... And by the way, have you noticed how quiet Eric Ibarra has been? Exactly. Michael Lofton threw a bar under the bus when Michael Lofton wanted to be a YouTube star. And he no longer needed his trusted 700 pound buddy. And so he threw him under the, actually you can't literally throw a bar under the bus. You could, you might could throw a bus under a bar. So maybe I've got that analogy backwards, but there you have it. All right, so I think that's everything. I want that there was one, I think there's one more point Tim makes. We'll on listen that to this. Point, uh, you were just asking me to chime in with things I'm finding on Twitter. On that point, Christopher Lamb um, has a tweet. He said, "Pope Francis's homily to open the synod stresses the gathering is not a polarized parliament or a place for political battles. The aim, he says, is to listen to the Holy Spirit, who quote often shatters our expectations yep. to create something new." What did I tell you, folks? What did I tell? I remember a very specific show I did about eight months ago. I remember the lighting was hitting the room exactly as then, so it, it triggered a very specific memory where I was talking about why Francis and the Sankt Gallen perverts, his minions, use the Holy Spirit surprises uh, as, a, as a consistent reference. And it's a way of gaslighting you to say, hey, the Holy Spirit... Yeah, man, he might say anything, that crazy old cad, the, goalie, the Holy Spirit. And um, look, also, it's not political. I'm just telling you what he said. Okay, women can be deacons. LMNOPs can now please each other in the bedroom, and we can bless it. I, oh, whoa, I'm surprised too. Crazy. The Holy Spirit just told me that. That's clearly what they're doing. I remember doing a show on this eight months ago, maybe nine months ago. And um, yeah, so Christopher Lamb said that that's part of the opening prayer is, hey, you're going to be surprised. And I've told you guys for two and a half years, the 2023 synod part will be a bombshell. That's why I'm, I'm basically free every day to do these shows. By the way, I will be on the Michael Knoll show. My All right, so uh, now... Tim has been right about a lot of this, particularly the point that the uh, seven years ago document in Amores Laetitia was preparing the way for the next phase of what they wanted to bring through. And as that guy that called in last night pointed out, this isn't a mystery or a theory. The leftists themselves are saying that, aha, finally, we know we have to incrementally push these things through. Now Francis is ready to do the next phase. And all the Pope Splainers and all the worshipers of Francis and this cult are now have, they all have the egg on their face. So Roman Catholics, it's time to wake up, man. This isn't the church. I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, if Pachamama wasn't enough and all the other stuff, I mean, at this point, that's why I'm at the point where it's like, I, I really, there's no more, I mean, other than people that I'm friendly with like Tim that I think I can reason with like the rest of you guys. Hey, good luck with that. We part ways. I can't reason with you anymore. I mean, Pachamama should have been, and I mean, it's like father Wyford said, like, has this not been demonstrated for all of you now? And you don't, you can't use this. What about problems in your church? We're not a papal church. So it's not an equivalence problem. It's not an equivalent problem. If the Orthodox Church was built around Bartholomew, I would agree with you. You would have a good point there. 
But Bartholomew has no more power than canonical privileges than any other bishop. And how many times has the Patriarch of Constantinople been a heretic? Many. How many times has the Bishop of Rome fallen away into heresy? Actually, quite a few times in history. There have been more in Constantinople that were heretical, but Rome has its share, as do all of the patriarchates, because we're not papists. We don't have one dude somewhere that we think is the oracle. And now, as Tim points out in this video, the oracle is saying the Holy Spirit is inspiring us to uh, come up with new morals for you. But Francis already did this by changing the death penalty morals officially. Remember when we brought this up to Trent? And Trent said, well, there might be four or five, three or four or five different ways you could come up with explaining this. Come up with explaining it. So there's creative interpretations of the contradictions now. One last point on this before we move on, because people didn't understand what I was saying. They thought I was saying... They thought I was saying that Ratzinger was co-writing a book advocating for everything that Habermas advocated for. That's not what I'm saying. And that was really dumb that you, it's dumb to even think that's what I was saying. Because I put this post up about the book that they co-wrote, which I own the book, first of all. Second of all, my undergraduate advisor studied under Habermas's protege. So I have... Frankfurt School of Marxistolic Succession, as I like to joke. I know the Frankfurt School very well. I'm not an expert in the Frankfurt School because I don't care to be. I don't care enough about the stupidity of Marxism to try to be an expert in this. But people on Twitter were saying, you haven't even read Habermas. You think that, that this is a, a, a co-written book promoting the Frankfurt School. It is actually that. But wait a minute. Benedict disagrees with Habermas. Yes, that's called synthesis that's called ant thesis antithesis synthesis the book itself is thesis antithesis synthesis did you not understand that was the point of the argument i wasn't saying that benedict co-wrote this book to promote the frankfurt school he's not going to openly do that that's not how dialectics works hegelian process philosophy which is what we covered in the lecture on marxist dialectics is that the truth is an evolving thing. Truth is the process of the discovery of every new synthesis. And that truth is also limited because it will find a contradiction and produce a new synthesis as well. It's an evolving process philosophy. That's what I was arguing. I own the book. I've read Ratzinger's. I've read seven of Ratzinger's books. You ain't even read Habermas. I lectured on whole Habermas books. Theory and Praxis. I lectured through the whole book for you. Years ago. You You ain't even done this. You ain't even done that. Frankfurt School, Habermas. Six years ago. The book is called Theory and Praxis. Theory and Praxis by Habermas. There's an entire lecture through the book for you. And I'm going to go get all of my old Marxist college and graduate school course lectures. And I'm going to all re-lecture and teach all of those for you. Because all these people say, I don't know what I'm talking about. When I literally studied under a Marxist Frankfurt School dude. My professor wrote his PhD, my advisor wrote his PhD on Hegel and Hegelian synthesis philosophy, process philosophy. Hegel and Marx was his PhD thesis. So I had Marxist critical theory classes, classical Marxist classes, French Revolution classes in... I was doing all of this in 2005, six.
Now, why are we talking about all that? Because to understand process philosophy and Hegelian dialectics is to understand the modus operandi of all of these people. Even if those people don't themselves know that much about it, they are part of a dialectical process worldview whereby the technocrats and the global elites and the social engineers understand that they can use diapraxis and uh, the application of dialectical process and philosophy, theory and praxis of Habermas, to achieve the end goals that they want. It's even in the Tavistock book by Coleman. He doesn't, he doesn't even know that it's Hegelian process philosophy, although Sutton actually does. Sutton has several sections in Secret Establishment where he actually under, uh, uh, pr properly identifies the Hegelian underlying structure. So that's why it's really important to go watch the Marxist dialectic talk that I did. This does not mean that all the people in the New World Order are Marxists, by the way. Stop being so dumb. I never said that. You think it's all Marxist. No, I'm the guy that says that it's dumb to say it's all Marxist. And I, somebody said uh, that they heard that the Abu Dhabi Faith Center broke Ibarra. Because remember, Ibarra wrote his big 400-page quote in my book to prove the papacy with giant font, which is probably why it's 400 pages. I'm not buying that thing. I saw sample pages. And then what does Francis do right after Ibarra drops what's going to be the bomb a papacy book that's going to convert everybody to Francis. Oh, Francis erects the Abu Dhabi multi-faith center with Jews and Muslims. Uh, exactly. Drops the bomb on them. Natural theology, the common generic God that we all share as monotheists. Why does anybody have a problem with it if they believe in natural theology? And note their uh, their weird cube lighting ceremony, the the evil trinity of dark light cubes they have. So you see, Jesus and the Trinity, they're in the way of this. This is the new emergent religion. Emergent religion. What does that mean when they talk about emergent philosophy, emergent religion? That's process philosophy. That's Hegelianism. That's, we are all on the path and the journey to discover the church and to discover the true religion. And the true religion is what will be given to you by these elites because they wrote about giving you a fake world religion 100 and 200 years ago. And this is it. This is just one element of it, though, because you needn't, you needn't think that will, it will only be monotheistic. No, it will incorporate all of your fancies. It will incorporate all of your demons and your proclivities, except for the triad, and the deity of Christ. That will not be allowed. Every other position will be allowed. And so, clear as day, they are now creating and pushing the Abu Dhabi Faith Center. The reason it's kids is that they're showing you the future generation. They're saying the future generations are going to be in this mystical Chrislam religion that is neither... Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. It is the emerging religion, the emergent religion, the process philosophy, the synthesis religion out of the dialectic or the trialectic. It doesn't matter. I mean, who cannot see this? If you do not see this, it is because you've lost your discernment. Because they said a long time ago via the, U the, the United Nations, this is the United Nations website, what's one of their participant organizations the lucis trust what is the lucis trust the network of light workers working together in the arcane school of alice bailey and what did we see about alice bailey the 10-point plan to destroy christianity 
Her books are sold and promoted still at the United Nations website. And what did Lucis... <clears throat> What did Lucis Publishing used to be? Lucifer Publishing. The Lucis Trust, which still exists and still has all of these witch books. They're literally selling you books from a witch. The official religious organ of the United Nations is selling you a gigantic set from a fucking witch. Pyramidiots, triangles and pyramidiots. What is the great invocation? This is their prayer. The great invocation at the former Lucifer Trust, influenced by Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, and Annie Besant, three witches. From the point of light in the mind of God streams forth into the mind. The light streams from the, into the minds of men. Let light descend upon earth. This is Lucifer, the light bearer. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth to the heart of men. May Christ return. And there's an asterisk. Who's Christ? Many religions. Here's the asterisk. The Christ is the Christ consciousness. Here's the asterisk. Do you see this? Pay attention, lazy people. May Christ return to earth. Many religions believe in a world teacher, the coming avatar. He has the name Maitreya, Lord Maitreya, Imam Mahdi, the hidden Imam, the Kalki avatar, and Bodhisattva. These are versions of the invocation for various peoples of faith. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the wills of men. The purpose of the mass, which the masters know and serve. Who are the masters? The ascended masters. That's, I'm not joking. That's literally talking about the ascended masters of Madame Blavatsky, who were, who? The leaders of the establishment. Blavatsky's ascended masters are her spy handlers. When you see through the jibber jabber, there you go. So you understand this is a United Nations website. This is conspiracy 101. This is like the conspiracy stuff you get into. I got, I learned this in 1998. All this UN crap. I, I've known this since 1998. Uh, 25 years ago, I learned this. 25 years ago, I read and learned books. I learned all about, read all, I read multiple books on the United Nations, its founding, its history, all about the De Joal Cool and Annie Besant and, and channeling the ascended masters and their arcane school and the messages for the New World Order. And people still want to argue whether it even exists. Let's see if they have... Well, they don't have on here that it used to be Lucifer Publishing, but it did. So they've taken that out. My thing, just battery just died. <laughs> anyway, so there's not much more. To, we're, we're getting to the end here. Now, how are we tying all this? So again, notice that Sufism was really important for changing and preparing the West for Islam. Islam is very important for changing the demographics, the culture, the society, to prepare it for where they want to go. And where they want to go is an emergent new world religion where everything blends together and probably Francis or who, who knows what, some weird future imam or whatever, they would like to see it converge into some just control thing. It doesn't matter what the trappings are. Maybe it's a little more Christian. Maybe it's a little more Muslim. Maybe it's a little more Jewish. Who knows where they want to take it. Maybe it's a little more syncretist and has everything. Maybe it's a full-on New Age thing. Who knows? But regardless, as long as it's run by the system, by the, the elites, it won't matter. They don't care about the trappings. I want to plug this thing in. Hold on a second.
So why does the emergent world religion matter so much? Because the emergent world religion is there as a kind of addendum to or a means of pushing and fostering the global elite technocratic order. So in other words, the new religion, which they're all pushing with the climate stuff and with uh, Francis talking about uh, irresponsible, you know, carbon usage and all this nonsense. And remember Francis's 10 commandments of the climate and all this stuff, which Bartholomew is absolutely on board with as well, just as evil. This relates to the coming push for austerity. And the, the push for austerity is the eating the bogs, living in the pod, you can't drive, 15-minute city, uh, C40 cities, banning meat, banning dairy, all of that. This is it. In your coom pod. That's what Jacques Attali says. That's what he said in this book in the 1990s. 1992, Dr. Coleman said everything that's rolling out right now. That's why Klaus and all these people have told you that. The 15-minute cities will mean that you do not drive outside of a designated zone if you're allowed to drive at all. It means that you will not have the freedom of commerce, but you will be subject to utilizing the tokens that the system allows, particularly probably some form of UBI. And the allotment and doling out of the UBI will be based on, via BlackRock and all the social credit scores, how you act and your what, how you relate to stakeholder capitalism. So this is basically socialist capitalism, where the system determines based on how you've acted on the internet and how you've acted in terms of perhaps even the big insurance companies tracking the way that you live. Oh, have you eaten too much red meat this week? Uh, you will not have access to your Netflix and your Coompod this week, you see. You will be punished. So you will not have families. You will not have any of these things. And so when you see this being pushed now, you understand this is not all, it's not chaotic. John Coleman told you all this is coming in 1992 in this book. What's the Biden administration talking about? Let's listen to this. How is the switch, the forced switch to electric going? It's going disastrously. First of all, on this strike, put pending strike, you have a million workers making non-electric cars. With these electric car mandates, you're talking about 40%, 400,000 workers being displaced. There's also about seven and a half million jobs related to the auto industry that are going to be impacted. Joe Biden's EV mandates are a controlled demolition of the US auto industry. There's no other way to put it because China is the main beneficiary and we're seeing a Chinese, potential Chinese invasion of cars, uh, EV cars coming as they master it. The transition is going horribly, but I think that's not the actual purpose of this Biden plan. The plan is to create vehicle rationing to force less people to drive, force us into mass transit and restrict our freedom of movement. That's but what's that, coming out of these climate plans. But Mark, that is. Yes, it's called Austerity, and it was the Club of Rome's plan uh, in the 1970s. It's 60 years old, and it's also in all the same books. So, I mean, the UN Bio Biodiversity Project, the Wildlands Project, the Agenda 21, Rio Bush Treaty with Maurice Strong and all those people from the uh, Club of Rome have already stated that this is the plan. And why is it the plan? Because it's what Klaus's plan is. Get your kick ass SEO in just two ninety nine a month. Say what? Small business. Now, some people said that this clip is fake. Uh, I'm not sure if it is, but even if it's not, it actually expresses. Uh, it expresses the reality of what Klaus wants to do. I mean, I think it, I, I haven't seen anybody definitively debunk this clip, but I suppose it's possible that it could be fake, a deep fake. But I mean, it expresses what Klaus, everything Klaus does every, everywhere else. Yeah, uh, if, if I look at our stakeholders, we have business, uh, of course. Uh, 
as a very important audience, and we have politics, we have uh, uh, continuous uh, uh, partnerships with many governments around the world, so, and of course we have NGOs, uh, we have trade unions, we have all those different parts. Media, of course. Media, of course, right? and very important um, experts and scientists and academia. Because if we are looking at the future, I think we should look at new solutions, and the new solutions will be very much driven by technological uh, developments. And we even have, uh, you even have religious leaders, right? Religious leaders, we have social entrepreneurs, very important social entrepreneurs. Religious leaders. Religious leaders. You mean like Francis. Exactly. Exactly. And what also might be involved in this future religion? Let's check out this blonde chick talking about Noah Yaval. AI will do or what impact artificial intelligence will have on the Bible and on religion. This is where the story from the get-go gets very creepy. Take a listen to this. You know, the printing press, radio, television, they broadcast, they spread the ideas created by the human brain, by the human mind. They cannot create a new idea. You know, Gutenberg printed the Bible in the middle of the 15th century. The, the, the printing press printed as many copies of the Bible as Gutenberg instructed it but it did not create a single new page. It had no ideas of its own about the Bible. Is it good? Is it bad? How to interpret this? How to interpret that? Um, AI can create new ideas, can even write a new Bible. We, you know, throughout history, religions dreamt about having a book written by a superhuman intelligence, by a non-human entity. Every religion claims our book, all the other books of the other religions, they humans wrote them. But our book, no, 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 no. It came from some superhuman intelligence. In a few years, there might be religions that are actually correct. That just think about a religion whose holy book is written by an AI. That could be a reality in a few years. Uh, so the possibility then of integrating the AI into an emergent deus ex machina, a god from within, a god from within the system, within the world system. Now, I don't know for sure if they'll do that. Who knows? But we're already beginning to see in various religions and churches, church and AI takeover as sermon led by chat GBT and artificial intelligence breakthrough. This is a Methodist church somewhere that is already allowing the AI to write this lazy pastor's sermons. And if you remember, there were people already also confessing to AI. Literally what we saw out of THX1138, right? Let's see if it comes up. This was a couple years ago. I think it was a church in Germany. So all I'm getting is a bunch of Catholic stuff. But there was a church in Germany somewhere that was already experimenting with uh, people confessing their sins to a robot. So here we are. I mean, all this stuff is emerging. It's not accidental. And I want, also, I want to remind you, too, that remember that Michael Lofton has said for the last seven years, there's no geopolitical conspiracy for a new world order. That doesn't exist. Francis is not part of the World Economic Forum agenda. And he's laughed at, mocked, and derided people like myself that talk about this. So there's a person with absolutely no discernment that has covered up and lied to you for the last seven years. It is very easy to verify that Francis is a part of all of this. And this, again, goes back to his time working with the CIA in Operation Condor. There you go. I want to remind you, too, that uh, we have a great show sponsor, which is chalk.com the best supplements on the internet if you head over to chalk.com you can use the promo code j50 to get 50 percent off the great products over at chalk they have literally the best supplementation out there um and i know this because i take chalk on the regular pretty much every day 
Um, you see there 25% off, but you actually get a much better discount, especially on stuff like the male vitality stack right there, which is perfect for dudes. Uh, you want to boost your testosterone. You want to make up for nutrient deficient diets that we have in the West. That $133 is actually 50% off if you use the promo code J50. That's J-A-Y-5-0 over at chalk.com. They also have the female vitality stack, which I recommend for ladies. Ladies can also take the Tonka Adelie, which is great for boosting testosterone to get the mojo up. Sheila J, great for, great for mental focus and clarity. Irish Moss, great for balancing out mood and hormones. So head on over to chalk.com and use the promo code J50, J-A-Y-5-0 to get 50% off. And there's that link right there. And I want to remind you too that uh, our show sponsor is also Richard Grove over at Grand Theft World. You can subscribe to Richard through heading over to Rockfin. And he's right here. Grand Theft World is, of course, one of the premier geopolitical podcasts, much like what you saw tonight. But they do a seven-hour deep dive every Sunday. So you can subscribe to Grand Theft World right there. And also, Richard is uh, about to start teaching his new course this semester on becoming independent and becoming a uh, entrepreneur on your own, mastering self-sovereignty, mastering the desire and the ability and executing that plan to become your own entrepreneur and business leader, business owner. And you do that over at that link right there that I put in the chat the University of Reason. And you can also get all of my books and all that at the shop at Jay's Analysis and subscribe to my website, jaysanalysis.com. And let's see, we got quite a few super chats tonight. I think we got to most of what I wanted to get to. Um, I did want to remind you too that, uh, you know, when it comes to attacking a religion, it's not just a matter of subverting the theology. You can actually do a full-on aesthetic attack by... Things like clown masses. And I'm not joking when I say this. And so when we see Francis engaging in these sort of clownish ceremonies and, and stuff like this, uh, that needs to be remembered. This is the devaluing of the religion by devaluing the sacred, you see. Now, I was making a joke when I said that this is the traditional Latin circus mass and not the liberal circus mass. Because it's not actually a mass. It's just an audience in the Paul the sixth, uh, snake, snake hall that they created. Um, I was making a joke, but we're actually going to see that Francis does in fact do puppet clown masses. So don't worry. This is just an example. And let's not forget the puppet masses. We got Pinocchio. We got Pinocchio. We got uh, some, look like some Instagram puppet thoughts over there. We, we got a whole crew up in this mass. ¿Cómo se sintió el ciego ese que Jesús le devolvió la vista? ¿Bien o mal? Yeah. People are asking, is this real? Uh, of course it's real. What are you talking about? Yes, I've played these clips so many times. Se sintió la Magdalena después que le perdonó todos los pecados. ¿Bien o mal? Yeah. This is a giant puppet mask. Yeah. ¿Cómo se van a sentir nuestros amigos, nuestros compañeros? Now, this alone should tell you that this is not the true religion. And I actually think that they're evil enough that they are intentionally doing this as a joke. As they're trolling their people because they actually despise their people. Podemos. 
sino solo con Jesús. Jesús con vos podemos. So there's puppet mass of Francis, and then here's Francis's tango mass. So he has the boomers doing the tango uh, in his mass. Yeah, anybody who knows that, you know, the one true God is worshipped in purity and in holiness and in reverence could never think or mistake this or him for the true church. I mean, these are abominations. But if puppet masses, clown masses, and boomer tango, boomer tango masses are not enough for you to see that this is not the true religion, um, hey, have fun with that. I, I wish you on your way. Enjoy the circus. All right, so we got some super chats here. Um, impressive work, sir. Five dollars from Gino. Thank you, Gino. Yeah, not many people have uh, gone deep into uh, the history of Sufism as a key tool for the New Age movement and for the Islamicization of the West. R2D2 Cage, ten dollars. This is off topic, but as Chris made it in November, I have two people that can make my sponsor and a friend. And one is an old man raising the faith, and I haven't told what the role of a sponsor is, so I don't know who to choose. Uh, I mean, your sponsors are just going to be like. You need a godfather and you need a sponsor, right? So choose your godfather wisely, somebody who helped you come into the faith, hopefully if you have that, or just somebody old and wise. Juliana, $15. Don't quit. We love you. Thank you, Juliana. Much appreciate. I'm not going to quit. I was just saying that. New Kingdom Media, $5. What are some of the books and people groups that I can look into for how the Anglican church was co-opted? Um, I don't know specifically about the history of the Anglican church on that specific topic, but how all of England was, was co-opted is in the Ratio book. So get this book, Milner Fabian Conspiracy by Ratio. It's a great book. I mean, it's going to, it's the same conspirators, but it doesn't go into Anglicanism itself. I assume it was due to uh, ideas and various timelines. If you have any info on this, I'd love to discuss it. Well, I just think that King Henry VIII is the beginning of the subversion. Uh, and well, actually, I, I take that back. Papalism is the beginning of the subversion because the English church originally was Orthodox. So, uh, Norman invasion. How about, how about 1066? How about that's the beginning of the subversion? Kristen, $5. Who else is going into the history of intelligence agencies and Sufis? You, and that's only you. And that's who. Thank you, Kristen. Appreciate your recognition of that. RL Stein, $3. <laughs> Why is it so much fun to scare children? Well, you're the very person we should ask. Mr. Stein, because you have, you, you are the source from which the eternal goosebumps proceeds. You are the eternal generator of goosebumps. So you are the one that is, who should be answering that question. LP $5. Thank you. Thank you. LP. Travis, a hundred bucks. He wins a super chat, uh, championship tonight. I got your super chat right here, dog. Keep up the good fight. Well, thank you so much, Travis. Really appreciate that. Makes it worth it. Daniel 316. Jay, buy yourself a coffee from uh, from Australia. Cheers. 316. I might buy a gas station coffee in America, but if you want me to go to Starbucks, you're going to have to give me about five bucks. Mr. Smirks, $5. Do not gaslight me into giving money. It won't work. And yet you gave me the money. My gaslighting worked on you. Ha ha. Big bala hala $5. This information is cray cray. Yes, it is. And that's why you only get it over here. Nitro $5. Did something happen in the Catholic world? Yes. Yeah, see my stream from yesterday. The four hour stream I did yesterday. Or watch the uh, Tim streams. All of my guy friends want to join and get married. But they're all single. I'm very confused. What is happening in the Roman Catholic world? Oh, that was a good one. I got it. Yeah. What's happening in the Catholic world? I don't understand. Suddenly all my guy dudes want to join it. <laughs> I guess you're joking. QT, $10. You claim to have covered a wide variety of topics, but not once have you shown feet. Here's $10 for your piggies. Let me see them. Okay, fine. There. How's that? 
you get five piggies for ten dollars that's a discount how do i become christian uh go to the local orthodox church and start to attend the liturgy and get the orthodox study bible and they will guide you in that process templar one dollar brother if i converted from islam to christianity what do i do with all the extra wives you donate them to tate bros goosebumps christian five dollar who is the funniest out of sam hyde nick rochford and charles do you like rugs and furniture um well when they were on MDE, it was all a collaborative, great effort. So they were all equally fun, funny. Um, I haven't followed a lot of Nick's stuff post MDE because it was a lot of like talking about house renovations and house sales and that kind of stuff. Uh, Charles's stuff was funny. The live streams are funny, but they also got really abstract and out there. So I think I would still say, Sam, do you like rugs and furniture? Uh, only insofar as I have 20% boomer in me. What design is your home and what design do you like the most? Uh, well, I just have like a normal house, but if we become zillionaires or something like that, I'll probably get like a Tony Montana style, garish, egregious, uh, Scarface style, just, just a dang drug lord freaking estate dude templar one dollar as long as he doesn't lead the church astray ex cathedra then this doesn't prove the catholic church any any in any way wrong okay sure right so if you want to fall back on that tired old thing which by the way tim just showed you that the amores Leticia is magisterium so it really doesn't matter whether it's ex cathedra or not student of shepherd five dollars See that no one takes you captive through vain philosophy, the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, not according to Christ. Um, if you're applying that to silly Sufism stuff, uh, I would agree with you. Sufism is a pseudo-mystical replacement for uh, legitimate Orthodox mysticism. Anglican Chef, $3. Jay, I've been watching for a while, and I recently started attending a Rokor church. It's been great. Awesome. I was wondering if I should read Goosebumps books in order. Should I choose your own adventure or choose your own goosebumps? Uh, bro, you need to lay off the R.L. Stein and, uh, you know, you need to restart reading the Orthodox Study Bible. Uh, SLID77F6D7F2EFD3611 gives $18.21. So I feel like that might be a robot uh, super chatting. Uh, wow, we got some fast super chatters tonight. Everybody, uh, the, the, generosity poured forth thank you so much bay's pay piggy 25 dollars. can we get an impression of erica barra explain why the chocolate fountain in the golden corral, uh, corral is ordinary magisterium well i've been here for 25 years going on every wednesday evening at 3 p.m and i can attest to the evidentiary fact that the chocolate fountain has always poured forth and has never ceased and for me, that's a strong enough argument to prove the Golden Corral is part of at least the lowest strata of ordinary magisterium, perhaps even mid strata. JB sixteen two six zero one hundred and twenty five dollars three thumbs up. Wow, thank you so much. That's uh, he actually beat out Travis for fattest super chat of the night. Haven't had a big old fat one like that in a long time. Thank you so much. You and Scipio Africana and Travis and AC uh, and BMX, y'all are the biggest super chatters. Uh, appreciate it so much. Your name, 10 bucks. Get some. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. John B. Kid, $3. I'm looming over the toilet at a desert, dead lizard in Orlando. I feel a presence of greatness. I wait for the stream. The door bursts open and Jay's greatness appears. Minutes later, I feel dirty. I saw. I told my girlfriend, Jadar just saw my weenus. Peace out. That was a weird super chat. J. Theus Dyer. J. Theus Dyer. Supposedly, J. F. Okay, I don't know about that, so I'm not going to read that. Henry, $5. Do you think Roman Catholics and Angl Anglicans won't convert because of Western Anglo supremacy? So I think there's a lot of reasons why people don't convert, and sometimes it is, um, you know, Bay's trad politics stuff. 
Can they not cope with true Christianity in the third world East? I mean, ultimately, it's not politics and ethnic stuff. It's like what's true. That's the. It's ultimately what it's about. What theology is right. Alula five dollars. I got you on your Starbucks. Here's five dollars. I was joking, dude. I ain't gonna no nasty Starbucks. But thank you for that. Element to Davisito five dollars. What is the Orthodox perspective on evil? We're called to love our enemies, despite that fact. Uh, it will lead to our demise. So it doesn't mean that you are a rug that you that you're an abused person and evil walks all over you loving your enemy means praying for them but it also means in certain cases to resist them so you there is self-defense you have a right to self-defense and all that it doesn't mean you become some sort of weak pushover royal crown ten dollars good show old chap well thank you royal crown much appreciated so yeah remember that sufism is one example of a western intelligence connected thing that integrates into larger geopolitical strategies as a religious movement to ultimately fo foster and, and force people into the NWO. And other examples demonstrate that as well. In other words, it's an example of a religious engineering for the ultimate religious engineering 